Okay, here's an algorithm for class design. You know, students always ask, well, how do you know what goes into a class? And I should just caveat by saying that this is a simple algorithm for simple class design. And I'm also talking about single objects and probably simple sim single objects. I'm not talking about collections of objects. You know, we get to collections a little bit later, and the design for those are a little bit different. So the first thing that you need to do, I mean, after you've identified the class name, right, I mean, what, what is it that you're trying to create? I mean, this is kind of an obvious thing, but... It needs to be stated. So is this a class for time? Is it a class for a, a calendar event? Is it a class for a student? And then once you do that, you identify the properties. The properties, the attributes, the data members, and maybe we should distinguish between properties that the... Um, you know, object in the real world has, and then the data members with which we're going to represent information about those properties. Um, so identify the properties and then the appropriate data members. And as you know, you, you already have some data members that you can use. So, you know, for example, you have integers, you have doubles, um, you have more complex class objects like string, but maybe you need to actually write some other class in order to implement the class that you need. So if I'm implementing an event, I might need a date class, I might need a time class, so I would have to implement those before I get to implement my event class. And of course, you know, these should be, these should be private. You always make your data members private. So once you've identified the properties of the class, then what you can do is start defining the methods. So you can declare and implement your methods. So always, always have a default constructor. And you need a default constructor because C++ uses the default constructor when you're passing in parameters. So if one's not there and you're passing in objects as a parameter, it's not going to compile. So you need implemented always implement a default constructor. So what what must the default constructor do? It really must initialize the primitive types or the basic types. So if you're using an integer or a double, when your object is constructed, those, those data members have unassigned values. And so it's, it's critically important that for integer, double, character, and Boolean, and when we get to pointers, pointers, that your default constructor initialize those basic types. It's less important for the string and for class objects because these class objects have a default constructor. So I'm talking about must here. If you want to, so, so the default constructor for the string will set it to the empty string. So it's been initialized. If you want to change it to something else, that's not a must, that's a can. Uh, you know, if you want your name to be called no name as its default value, that's fine, but that's not necessarily any better than the empty string. However, in the case of these basic types, having one that is unassigned can cause your program to crash. So it must initialize the basic types. And, you know, just as a general rule, you know, what should these values be? 
not knowing what class we're talking about, uh, the only thing I can really say is, is set doubles to 0, 0.0, 0. Uh, set ints to 0, set characters uh, to maybe the null character, and set bulls to false. Now, if you tell me something about the class you're defining, I may change this. Maybe 1 is a better default value. Um, so it really depends, but not knowing anything about the class, I would say that these would be reasonable uh, default values for any of the basic types, and, and the default constructor should do that. Then, of course, you should have an explicit constructor. And, you know, again, for uh, what you want to do here is you want to give the programmer an opportunity to provide a value for all of the private data members. So with a parameter for each private data member. each private data member. Now again, not knowing anything about the class, if you, you know, told me a class, uh, you know, maybe I would change this, but I think this is a reasonable assumption. So if you have a time object, an employee object, you're going to want to give a programmer the opportunity to pass in values for each of those private data members. You're going to need set methods for each private data member. Right. So I, I want to be able to change each private data member and change only that private data member. Maybe you give me other set methods that will let me change data, private data members in co some combination, but as a bare minimum, I want to see set methods for each private data member. Same thing for get methods. I want get methods for each private data member. And again, I want to be able to deal with the object as an object, but I also want to be able to retrieve individual attributes, individual pro properties, individual data members of an object. So I want to be able to get a person's name then I think you're going to need all of these input and output methods that we've discussed. So you're going to need an enter method for uh, entering information from the interface, whether it's from the command line or whether it's through a nice GUI on a mobile phone. You're going to need to be able to write that information to disk or to a database or over a network connection you're going to want to print that information to the interface in a nice format for the user. And then finally, you're going to need a read method that is going to read information from a database, from a file, or from a network connection. So, you know, as we said, we have this, you have the app, and you have the user, and then you have the disk, and who knows what that disk is. It could be a file, a database. The communication could be over a network connection. And so you really need write, you need read, and then for interaction with the user, you want print and enter. A lot of times the formats are different. The way you pre present information to the user is not necessarily how you write it to disk. It could be. If it is, then you can collapse some of these methods into a single method. And then what you name them, whether it's write or print or read or enter, is really up to you. Then I would look for any kind of other operators. So, for example...
I guess what I would say, we're on F now. So what about, you know, class specific operations? So comparison methods. Do you need to be able to compare to see if one object is less than another? For some objects, that's not going to make any sense. It doesn't make any sense that student A is less than student B. Now, it, you might need to do that in order to sort those objects. And usually you would sort based on the student ID or maybe their last name. So maybe you need some comparison methods. Uh, what about, uh, you know, arithmetic methods? So time, for example, you know, we want to be able to add times together. It certainly doesn't make any sense to add two students together. It makes sense to add time together. So there are going to be a lot of class-specific operations. And you know, these can be what I would say, you know, class driven or they could be application driven. So class driven is, you know, what ways can we manipulate objects. So think about, you know, again, let's talk about time. What are all the operations that we can perform on time? We can add them, subtract them, compare them, less than, greater than. So, you know, when you're doing some sort of a class-driven implementation, you think about what possible things could you do with a time object, and then you implement those class-specific operations. But it could also be application-driven. You know, what does the application require? What does the app require? Maybe you don't need, for a given application, maybe you don't need to add time objects. You only need to compare them. So in that case, you simply, uh, you know, define the methods that you need based on what the application requires. And usually that's specified in some sort of requirements document. And finally, you know, if you're talking about C++, what about overloaded operators? So if you've defined these class-specific operations, are they methods, or are you going to overload operators instead, or are you going to do both? So if I have an add method, maybe I also implement an operator plus equals. I can either give the programmer both, or you can simply decide I'm only going to have add and I'm not going to overload the operator, or I am only going to overload the operator and I'm not going to do the add method. You could say the same thing for the stream insertion and stream extraction operators. So what overloaded operators? are you going to have. So that's a simple algorithm that at least for the first semester class you should be able to follow in defining objects for or classes for storing information about single objects.